Good day, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend our first of five-part webinar series. My name is John Susser, and my role today is playing the host. My colleague, Paul Keo, is an expert with many years of experience in the industry. We'll be sharing our accumulated knowledge with you. Paul will be doing the heavy lifting today. Our industry has certainly been challenged over the years, and we hope we can assist you in some manner to improve our, your operations with what we have learned on our journey to improve seal and reliability. Some housekeeping rules? Please feel free to ask questions if you have them. We will try to answer them during the presentation. Type your questions in the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. We will also leave 10 minutes at the end of our presentation to capture any questions we did not cover. We have a lot to show you today, so without further ado, Paul. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Just a couple slides about uh, the world of Chesterton. Uh, Chesterton was founded back in uh, 1884, and we're headquartered in Groveland, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. We're truly a global manufacturing organization with uh, sales and service locations as well in North America, South America, Europe, Middle East and Africa, as well as Asia Pacific, with worldwide distribution and service centers. The key bullet on that slide is the 1,200 people that we have out on the streets that have spent years upon years in developing new uh, solutions that make equipment run more reliably within your plants. Chesterton is a leader in fluid sealing solutions and equipment infrastructure protection. Chesterton is also known for our award-winning pump and valve sealing solutions and services, as well as industrial lubrication and industrial wear protection products. That second bullet, I'm sure you've had many vendors say the same thing with a strong commitment to innovation. But the 1,200 people on the street is a testament to our legacy in developing these new solutions uh, that help uh, customers and plants run uh, more reliably, efficiently, and economically. As John said, we have a lot to cover today. So our focus for today is this, and I'd like you to think about the following in terms of sealing strategies. Seals represent about 2 to 5 percent in the overall acquisition cost of a pump. Yet, 70 to 80 percent of unscheduled pump shutdowns are seal or packing related. So it's critical to understand what sealing systems are needed and how you ask for it. And it kind of all boils down to specifications. And there's a part in specifying the best sealing system without overkill. I've had the opportunity to work with many engineering firms across North America and had the opportunity to look at many specifications. In one particular instance, there was a, a pump that had a double welded metal bellows seal made from Inconel for this particular application in wastewater. Will the system work? Absolutely it'll work. Unfortunately, you paid exceedingly uh, uh, an exceeding amount for the application. So the idea is specifying the best sealing system without overkill. And we want that system to enhance operation and maximize value to the end users. About 15 years ago, the Department of Energy did a study on problems and, and the resolutions of startups of uh, major capital projects. And right at the top of the list, or close to the top of the list, were pump seals. So what we're going to be talking about uh, during our webinar today are some of the common sealing strategies that are used in the water and wastewater industry. It's kind of an evolution, if you will, of the technologies that have been developed over a period of time. We're going to be talking about mechanical packing, single component seals, cartridge seals, split seals, and we'll finish up with zero and reduced flush sealing systems. So, in the beginning, if you will, uh, there was mechanical packing, which was the most rudimentary form of shaft sealing. Here's a typical end suction centrifugal pump, and here's a depiction of where you would find the most common packing arrangements. If you notice, 
we have two rings of backing inboard, three rings of backing outboard. We have a lantern ring connection, as well as an adjustable gland follower. So what is mechanical packing? It's a resilient material formed around the shaft to create a long axial uh, seal. An adjustable gland is used to compress the packing between the stuffing box bore and the shaft. Tightening the gland, that adjustable gland that we showed on the previous slide, reduces the clearance between the box bore and the shaft. But as the shaft rotates, it wears additional clearance into the packing. So that requires further gland tightening, which is a labor activity, and there's a cost associated with that. Friction between the shaft and packing generates heat and wear, which leads to the deterioration not only of the packing itself, but of the shaft sleeve. If we throw solids or abrasives in the pl uh, pump fluid into the mix, they embed into the packing and wear at the shaft sleeve. So what we do is we introduce flush water, typically in, measured in significant gallons per minute, and we introduce it via a lantern ring to lubricate that packing arrangement. And because we're not only uh, lubricating those inboard packing rings, but also the outboard packing rings, this flush fluid must also leak to the environment. So here's a little depiction of what takes place within that stuffing box, and we're going to explain that to you now. We have the two rings of packing inboard, followed by our lantern ring connection, and three rings of packing outboard, followed by the adjustable gland packing. We introduce flush water into the system to lubricate those packing rings. If we introduce wastewater into the, the, uh, the mix here, we want wastewater is trying to intrude into the stuffing box. So we provide that flush uh, water at a pressure greater than the wastewater pressure. So in essence, instead of sealing the wastewater itself, we are sealing the clean flush water. As we mentioned previously, as we start wearing clearances into the packing uh, material, we have to make further adjustments on that gland in order to tighten down on those clearances. Over a period of time, as we continue to tighten down on that gland, if you'll notice, the red lantern ring there is being pushed further and further into the stuffing box, away from the source of the flush water. So we don't get the full force and effect of the flush fluid itself. And what that can lead to is not only a deterioration in the packing, but that wear in the shaft sleeve itself. Unfortunately, that can lend, uh, lead to a, a shaft sealing surface that's unacceptable for the packing rings. And so therefore, now we start getting leakage of the wastewater itself. And here is a picture of what's commonly seen on shaft sleeves. We have excessive wear where that sleeve surface now is no longer uh, usable for the mechanical packing. Here's another look at a, a sleeve that has worn. Notice where here on where the outboard rings were. Significant wear on the inboard rings. This is where the lantern ring was here. So to sum up packing, there are distinct advantages for, for packing, and they're commonly used today throughout the industry. And the first uh, element is its inexpensive acquisition cost. If we have a good maintenance practice within the plant, and we haven't done ex excessive damage to the shaft sleeve, we can replace the packing uh, and, and uh, put in new packing without having to dismantle the pump. Some perceptions about packing, it's easy to install. One millwright said it once upon a time, packing is easy to install only when you do it wrong. There's a, almost an art in installing packing properly. There's a breaking in period so we don't do damage uh, to the packing upon startup. 
The second perception is that it's easy to replace packing. In our animation, we showed how we pushed that lantern ring and those in two inboard rings further and further into the stuffing box. What happens is that becomes problematic in removing those, those rings of packing and the lantern ring itself. And more often than not, we find instances where the solution is that they just add, maintenance adds three rings of packing uh, outboard and hope that that will uh, do the trick. Unfortunately, that's a recipe for disaster and will uh, lead to uh, a quick downtime. We've, we've already touched on some of the di uh, disadvantages of packing. First of all, that they're designed to leak. Um, uh, they require excessive flush water for lubrication and cooling. As I mentioned earlier, it's typically significant gallons per minute. We touched on the sleeve damage and, and the replacements uh, of those uh, sleeves. Frankly, if you have to replace a sleeve, then we have to dismantle the pump. And that's a, a very expensive labor activity. We also know when we're just maintaining the packing that they require frequent adjustments. So there's a cost associated with that. With the leakage from packing, there is also a variety of different impacts, including bearing failure and corrosion. And lastly, there's added power consumption with the use of uh, packing rings. Essentially, we're, ta we're tightening down on that shaft sleeve with the packing rings. So it's kind of like driving a car with the, uh, one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. So to address some of the issues associated with packing, uh, mechanical seals were developed. And here's our, our pump again. And if you'll take a look at this uh, uh, depiction here, we notice the mechanical seal is sitting outside of the stuffing box itself. What's significant about that is when we've had a situation in which we've done damage to that shaft sleeve from, uh, from uh, packing, we can retrofit mechanical seals and typically that mechanical seal is going to sit outside of the stuffing box. So, the, so we don't have to disassemble that pump in some instances to remove the uh, shaft sleeve. This area where the seal is running here is generally in pristine condition. So mechanical seals from all manufacturers, manufacturers generally consist of two extremely flat surfaces called faces, one rotating, one stationary. Now those faces are held together by two uh, elements, the product pressure in the pump itself and some spring force in the seal to prevent product from escaping to the environment. The visible leakage that usually comes from compression uh, packing is eliminated. Now, technically speaking, there is a migration of fluid across those seal faces. From the um, as it migrates across that the seal faces to the atmospheric side, the fluid typically uh, evaporates, and so we don't see that visible leakage. But we do need that migration of fluid to lubricate those seal faces, and we'll touch on that some more. All mechanical seals have basic common elements. This the primary seal, which is that uh, interface between the rotating and the stationary face. There's always some sort of spring mechanism. That could be a single spring. It could be multiple springs or some sort of bellows. There is uh, typically a series of secondary seals made up of either O-rings or bellows or V-rings and some metal components that essentially keep the guts of the seals together. In water and wastewater, the most common uh, seals that you'll find in non-submersible pumps are going to be component seals, split seals, and single cartridge seals. Components, as the name would imply, are a series of components that are mounted onto the shaft sleeve itself. They're typically low cost, and they vary somewhat in cost and widely in performance. If we take a look at a typical component seal, we can identify those key components for you. There's that primary seal between the rotating and the stationary face.
some series of springs, be they the single spring or multiple coil spring, and some sort of secondary seal. In this case, it was a Teflon wedge, and there are also some uh, secondary seals located here and here. Okay, and some series of metal components here that hold the guts of the seal together. And all these elements are installed at the pump manufacturer or at the end user site. The key thing to remember here is that it requires precise measurements for proper installation. When installing a component seal, the key thing is that the seal faces must remain clean and undamaged during handling and installation. That incorrect installation that we refer to can result in a, a premature seal failure. The key issue here is generally associated with spring load on those faces. When we talked about that migration of fluid between those sealed faces, we need to have that fluid. If we have too little spring load on those sealed faces, obviously when the shaft rotates and those springs flex two times per each revolution, we could have excessive leakage between those faces having visible leakage to the environment and actually doing damage to the seal faces. But at the other side of the spectrum is if we have too much spring load on those seal faces and we prevent that migration of fluid, we start generating a lot of heat because of lack of lubrication on those seal faces. And it does damage to the seal faces themselves as well as those secondary seals. So a majority of seal failures from component seals come from misinstallation. To address those issues associated with those, that component installation, the next generation of seals were cartridge seals. And essentially what was done here is we took all those key components of the, the, compo uh, the component seal itself and we mounted them on this cartridge sleeve here and those components were installed at the seal manufacturer's facility. So all that needed to be done at the pump manufacturer in the field was to slide the seal onto the shaft, bolting it to the uh, stuffing box, and then setting the set screws down, and away you go. Okay, so no special skills were required for installation. The key disadvantages with uh, cartridge seals is, well, cost because we have these extra components, the initial acquisition cost is higher than a component seal. But one of the key factors with, uh, associated with cartridge seals and the disadvantage is that in, many, in all instances, you have to disassemble the pump to remove the seal. Some of the design features in a cartridge seal, we want a stationary seal. What does that mean? We talked about one stationary face and one rotating face. What it boils down to is we'd like to see the springs on the stationary side of the seal, if you will, the stationary face, as you can see here. If we go back a few slides, and bear with me one second, and we take a look at this component seal depiction here, we have the seal located on the rotating side. We would prefer to see the seals on the stationary side, uh, and, and it allows those seal faces to track better. Okay. We also want to see those springs made from some sort of anti-corrosive material, and we want them located outside of the pump fluid. Let's jump back a few slides again, and once again, here's our springs located in the fluid. If we're pumping uh, a fluid that has solids in the fluid itself, Excuse me. Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. If we had the springs located in the fluid itself, any solids could embed within those springs and uh, uh, won't allow them to work properly. So that flexing and recovery action that we want on those seal faces could be uh, prohibited and uh, leading towards a, a premature seal failure. So we want the springs located outside of the pump fluid, as you can see here. 
Okay? So the fluid would be here. We don't have any issues with regard to solids embedding into those seal faces. We talked about some of those disadvantages of the cartridge uh, uh, seal, primarily being having to disassemble the pump to remove the seal. And we're talking about an industry, water and wastewater, where it's not uncommon to have pieces of equipment with extremely large shaft sizes, big pieces of equipment. So it requires significant and a costly uh, labor uh, uh, intensity, if you will, to remove a cartridge seal. So as a result of that, one well, of the next generations in, in seal development was the development of split mechanical seals. As the name implies, all the components of a mechanical seal are split axially, which allows us to install or remove a seal without any equipment disassembly. So on large pumps where typically multiple trades would be required to remove or install a component or cartridge seal, you know, like electricians or pipe fitters, riggers, mechanics, whatever it may be, uh, that's not required with a split mechanical seal. When we reinstall a split mechanical seal, there's no couple, coupling realignment required. So by far, far, split mechanical seals are the easiest to repair in the field. And quite frankly, when you're looking at large pieces of equipment and hauling around big components of a pump, if, you, if you're using a component seal and you have to disassemble those, there's a safety element that's involved. So split seals definitely has a place when it comes to large pieces of equipment. Most practical uh, to utilize seals, split mechanical seals on large shaft diameters. Uh, you can talk to most of the mechanical seal manufacturers and generally they have a rule of thumb as to when split mechanical seals should come into the conversation. From our own perspective here, when we start talking about shaft sizes in excess of two and a half inches, then we start thinking about, uh, or at least bringing into the conversation, the use of split mechanical seals. We start talking about mechanical, uh, split mechanical seals when downtime is expensive or critical or unacceptable. Now there's not a process uh, within wastewater treatment that we wouldn't deem as critical or unacceptable, but if we go to other industries that well, as well, it uses large pieces of equipment, mining, for example, gold slurry applications, where downtime is lost revenue. Obviously, having to disassemble a pump is taking away from the bottom line. So you see a lot of split mechanical seals used in those types of applications as well. Split seals are also comparable now in cost to cartridge seals. Most uh, split seals have spare part kits, which are relatively inexpensive. Once again, we touched on it before, there's no realignment of pumps necessary when you remove and reinstall a split mechanical seal. And the last element there, new designs have become very, very uh, easy to install. As I mentioned, split seals are kind of like component seals, with all the components mounted around the shaft itself. Over the development of um, uh, split mechanical seals, the number of components has reduced significantly. So they're very, very easy to install. The key here is that they still maintain their field repairability. We want a split seal that can seal both pressure and vacuum. We want to see those springs outside of the process fluid. We want a hydraulically balanced seal. And we could have touched on this earlier, but uh, if we wanted to, we could bring a seal engineer in here and spend a complete day on a hydraulically balanced seal. What is a hydraulically balanced seal? Simply put, we're balancing the closing and opening forces acting upon those seal faces. We're trying to develop that sweet spot where we get lubrication of those seal faces so we get optimum performance out of the mechanical seal. Once again, we're looking for minimal number of components on those split seals. And finally, we want it to be field repairable. Okay, there are some designs out there that may be just two halves. But when it comes to trying to do a field repair on those particular uh, seal designs, uh, the, the complexity of the repair is significant. So we want to 
minimize the components, but we want it to maintain the field repairability. So we've talked about the common sealing strategies that are used. How do we go about deciding which one we use? What's the seal selection criteria? We always take a look at the fluid properties themselves. What is it that we're sealing? What are the operating conditions that are uh, taking place within the, the sealing chamber and the pump itself? What's the equipment to be seen, uh, sealed? How large is it? And that's going to lead us to the seal design that's chosen. From there, we determine the, the materials that are compatible for the application. And then we determine the environmental controls that are used to support the sealing system. We'll talk about environmental controls in a, a little bit. In terms of size, and we touched on this um, uh, already, in terms of shaft sizes, when we're looking at shaft sizes smaller than two and a half inches, then perhaps a cartridge seal is the most suitable solution. Because due to the relatively small size of the pump, pump dismantling is not overly difficult or time consuming. However, once we start getting over two and a half inches in shaft size, that's when we start wanting to think, at least to think about uh, split seals because of the complexity of, re uh, and, uh, of removing the pump and the costs associated with that. In terms of material of construction, in water and wastewater, essentially we're sealing water. But there is a, uh, a certain percentage of solids that will be entrained within the pump um, uh, fluid depending upon where it is in the treatment process. But because of that, we typically use hard faces. Silicon carbide versus silicon carbide is not uncommon. The secondary seals that we use are generally made from FKM or EP. And once again, the springs, we want an anti-corrosive material, either Hastelloy or Elgiloy. The metal components are typically made from 316. So what are these environmental controls for seals that we talked about earlier? Environmental controls are strategies used to control the temperature, pressure, and the fluid inside the stuffing box so our seal can work in the, the optimum environment. Bottom line, environmental controls are the life support system for the mechanical seal. And we actually used environmental controls for packing as well, which was the flush water. Same goes for mechanical seals traditionally, flush water. Okay. From one major uh, pump manufacturer, Seal environment is critical for extended seal life. The number one cause of pump downtime is failure of the shaft seal. These failures are normally the result of an unfavorable seal environment, such as improper heat dissipation or poor lubrication, uh, operating seals and containing solids, airs, or vapor. Hey, when you boil it down and you talk to any seal manufacturer, the two things that will kill a mechanical seal, heat, or dirt, okay? Heat generated from a seal running in vapor and dirt, whatever it may be that might be entrained in the pump fluid. In water and wastewater, we're trying to control those fluid properties and we're trying to remove trap air. Those are the most significant concerns in, in water and wastewater. What we're trying to do is prevent solids from building up and keeping abrasives away from the, the seal faces. We're also trying to prevent heat generation at the seal faces. So the most common single seal environmental control is flush. And flush is a clean, cool fluid typically used with some sort of restriction bushing in the stuffing box to create some sort of flow, okay, with the intent to prevent solids from building up in the stuffing box and keeping uh, abrasives away from the, the faces themselves. And we introduce that flush at a pressure greater than the pump fluid pressure. We're trying to push air out of the stuffing box and we're going to try and force liquid film across those seal faces of the flush fluid, a clean fluid. So we've changed the game. 
and trying, instead of trying to seal the pump fluid, we're sealing the flush fluid. In water and wastewater, the sources of our flush water, either city water or plant effluent. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute uh, created a whole series of um, um, piping plans to depict the various um, em environmental control strategies. Clean flush, as we've described uh, in the last couple signs, uh, slides rather, is shown as API Plan 32. And what we're doing is introducing flush fluid at a certain flow at a pressure greater than the pump fluid pressure, typically 15 to 20 PSI above the pump fluid pressure, introducing it into the seal in conjunction with this restriction bushing. We're building up a back pressure and we're maintaining a clean environment on which the seal can run. So once again, we're not sealing the pump, we're not sealing the pump fluid, we're sealing the flush fluid. But unfortunately, there are issues with flush uh, water to seals. In building, let's say, a new plant or expanding a particular plant, there's a capital cost associated with flush systems. What about the reliability of these flush water systems? In talking to operators around the country, uh, we have many instances where flush water systems have failed. So what's the reliability of the flush water systems? There's also a saying where if there's a valve to be turned off, sooner or later it's going to be turned off. And if it has anything to do with flush water systems, then we've got some potentially major league issues for our, our sealing systems. What's the quality of flush? In terms of water and wastewater treatment, eh, really not too many quality uh, issues on quality because we, use, we do use city water. Or we use plant effluent. If we're using flush water, city water, there's a cost associated with that. A typical cost of flush, as depicted here in the slide, $0.002 per gallon, is introduced into the, the uh, seal at a particular flush rate. Common rule of thumb for flush water rates, one gallon per minute per inch of shaft size. So if we have a shaft size of two inches, the typical flush rate would be two gallons per minute. Utilizing the cost on a pump operated uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, here's the cost of one pump for uh, a two uh, with two inch shaft over the course of one year, over $2,000. Now if we take a look at a treatment typical treatment plant, we know that the shaft sizes in those treatment plants are typically significantly larger than two inches of shaft. So we have a significant amount of flow. And there's a cost that's associated with that, that cost coming to the rate users and the, the, the uh, municipalities and to the, uh, the taxpayers themselves. So we want to mitigate the use of that, that, that cost. What about plant effluent? Ah, we're not using that city water on the cost. But think about this for a second. We spend X amount of dollars to treat a gallon of sewage, for example, from influent to effluent. And then we take that effluent and we push it right back into the system again and we're retreating it. There's a cost associated with that. So it's not the most efficient and cost economical um, solution as well. So in be it city water or plant effluent, we want to eliminate or reduce the amount of flush water that's used. And quite frankly, we're trying to remove, when we take solids out of the treatment process itself, we're trying to remove as much water as we possibly can when we're trucking off or, or uh, disposing of that solids that, that, that is the end result of our process, one of the results of our process. So the last thing we want to do during this process is introduce more fluid uh, through uh, flush water systems. 
So we want to reduce or eliminate wherever we can the use of flush water. I'm bringing this slide in here because of uh, my couple of years in the, uh, uh, the industry, one of the things, one of the biggest causes of shaft seal failure is in vertical pumping. And it has to do with the fact that we want to maintain a fluid environment in which the seals to work. When a pump is flooded, the seal is sitting at the highest end of the uh, um, highest part of the wet end of the pump. As the fluid enters the pump, an air bubble is trapped in and around the seal faces. So unless we uh, vent off that air from the stuffing box, from the seal chamber and around the seal, our seal is going to be running in a dry environment. We'll have no face film lubrication and we'll do damage to the seal and that'll cause quick seal failure. So to address that particular element, one of this, the um, environmental control strategies is called API Plan 13. For you end users are out, that are out there uh, listening to this presentation, if you take nothing away from this presentation at all, when it comes to vertical uh, pumping applications, please ensure that API Plan 13 is used as part of the seal selection um, process. So let's touch on state-of-the-art sealing. So it's seal designed to minimize life cycle costs. And based upon the size of the equipment used in um, water and wastewater, typically that would lend itself to split seals because of large pieces of equipment. And we want to, uh, in addition to the split seals, utilize effective environmental control, specifically addressed at reducing or eliminating flush water requirements. We want to eliminate or reduce flush water systems wherever poss uh, possible. But we want to maintain the, uh, the seal reliability. We want to maintain that environment. Remember, going back to our initial slide, 70 to 80 percent of unscheduled pump shutdowns are related to uh, seal failures. Okay, so we want to maintain that environment for optimal seal performance. And that's based on good environmental control but we want to do it by reducing or eliminating flush systems. So we use active throw bushings wherever possible to do that. Okay, So we can reduce the planned operating cost by eliminating that flush fluid wherever possible and enhancing the reliability of the seal so we don't have to remove that seal and remove the pump from operation. So what are active throw bushings? Active throw bushings are used with split mechanical seals or component seals or cartridge seals for that matter to reduce or eliminate flush fluid required and further enhance seal reliability by driving seal cavity circulation and exchange. Whew, that's a mouthful, okay? Essentially what we're doing when the pump is turned on based on what's taking place in that uh, seal chamber or stuffing box with the rotating elements of the seal, because of the centrifugal action, the solids, the, the heavier uh, uh, pieces of material are thrown to the box bore and then migrate along the so uh, box bore. And they're captured within spiral grooves in those active throw pushings. And they're removed from the, the uh, fluid itself and ejected back into the pumpage itself. So the seal is working in a clean environment. And we do this without the use or, or a reduced amount of flush water required. So this is a common setup of a zero or reduced flush technology sealing system, which we have our seal outboard and the active throw pushing here. And what we've done is, in working with pump manufacturers, we remove, removed the cast and throw that are typically found in a typical stuffing box, and we press fit the active throw pushing from the impeller side into the stuffing box. So in this particular depiction, here is that excuse me, that cast-in throat that I was talking about, 
We have the, seal, the pump manufacturers remove this throat and we install the spiral track or the active throat bushing in from the impeller side. We can actually uh, install the active throat bushing from the mechanical seal side as well in a retrofit basis and that's pushed up against that throat and we still have the action in terms of removing the solids but we do require a minimal amount of flush in that particular configuration. So if we go back to what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are two things that kill a mechanical seal, heat and dirt. And we talked about heat coming from a seal potentially running in air and not in liquid. Well, here's a video of what happens in a typical stuffing box. So you can see the pump fluid starting to fill the stuffing box. But because of that cast in throat, it essentially acts as a dam and traps a bubble of air inside the seal chamber or stuffing box. Here's a mechanical seal and here's the cast in throat here. So we've got a bubble of air. In our next video, once we turn on the pump, the heavier fluid is thrown into the box bore, but you can see from the air bubbles here, that the air is migrated around the seal faces. And so now the seal is not working in that environment that, we, that it was intended to do. Okay, we have air around those seal faces. So we're not getting that film of lubrication that we expect seals to run in. So how do we address that? What we've done is the casting throat is machined out and we've inserted a, a, an active throat bushing here at the back of the stuffing box with a notch that's machined in at the 12 o'clock position here. So what has happened is as we filled that stuffing box, that notch or vent allowed air to be vented out of the seal chamber. So now we have our seal running in a liquid environment. So it was essentially removed uh, public enemy number one, heat. Next video. What about public enemy number two, dirt? Well, here's our particles, whatever solids that might be running, might be in the entrained fluid. Okay, and those are working up against and around the, the seal faces with potentially, potentially doing damage to those seal faces. So traditionally we address that by introducing flush fluid into the process at a pressure greater than the, the pump fluid pressure to push those solids out of the stuffing box. So we're having our seal run in a clean environment. But we talked about the costs associated with using Flush fluid. So how do we address that? With active throw pushing technology, once the pump is turned on, notice immediately the particles are thrown by centrifugal action to the box bore. And as I make way down the shaft, they're captured in the spiral grooves of the active throw pushing. And with a short period of time, you see that now, within the seal chamber of the stuffing box, solids have been removed. And the seal is running in a clean environment. Clean environment, we've eliminated public enemy number two, solids, heat.
We've, uh, we've reduced, uh, we've removed heat, public enemy number one, and dirt, solids, public enemy number two. From one municipal client came this comment. The use of active throw pushings are both an economically and environmentally responsible upgrade for pumping applications. This particular user has, has reduced water consumption in his plant and was a mandate by the municipality itself to reduce the use of flush water. And as a result of using active throw pushing technology, he was able to accomplish that, that goal. So in summary today, guys, we've talked about the common sealing strategies that are used in the water and wastewater industry. We've talked about packing and mechanical seals. We've talked about their design features and their advantages and disadvantages. We've talked about the seal selection criteria used in water and wastewater. And we've also talked about environmental controls. Finally, we talked about state-of-the-art sealing in water and wastewater today. We've talked about split seals and active throw pushing technology. We want to thank you for uh, attending uh, our seminar today. We have a few housekeeping issues that we'd like to touch on. Okay, so housekeeping. So what we want to do is we want to get uh, some uh, opinions from you in terms of the uh, uh, presentation that we gave. So we're going to ask you to complete our short survey, which we're going to post uh, there on the left-hand side. Okay, so uh, if you could go to it, click on it, and respond to us, we would appreciate it so that, you know, we get four more of the presentations that we're going to be doing, and we want to make sure that we maximize your value when we do this. So, you know, any input that you can give us is helpful and, uh, and you know, wanted, all right? Number two, on Monday, we're going to be forwarding you information on this presentation. We're going to give you a link to, uh, for those who didn't see it or those who want to, you know, review any of the material that we went through, uh, we're going to send you a link to uh, the YouTube uh version of the presentation. We're going to post it on YouTube so it's uh, available 24-7 uh, for anyone that wants to review it. All right, so we'll also give you dates and information in terms of how you can uh, uh, sign up for the next seminars that we're going to be doing. All right, if you want to share this information, if you think that this uh, is valuable or the series is valuable to, you know, other users that you know, uh, please send them the information. All right, so that you'll help be helping them out and we can, you know, help you guys out. So uh, if you could, we would uh, ask you to do that. If you have any questions, all right, that we didn't answer, you can email either Paul Keo, right? So we have his uh, email address or myself. So, uh, you know, any questions that you have, we'll get right back to you. And we want to thank you uh, for attending this session. And, uh, you know, we want to wish you a happy uh, weekend, nice weekend. Uh, we hope to see you in the following uh, four seminar series as well. Uh, next slide. So we have the dates here. All right, so in the, uh, the topics that we're going to be carrying uh, over the next ones, uh, you know, obviously the June 3rd was today, and the others, uh, we have one on July 1st, August 5th, September 2nd, and October 7th. So, you know, we would, uh, you know, urge you to attend all these sessions or sessions that pertain to your business. Uh, and if we have any questions, we'll answer them now. Are there any questions there, Paul? Um, I don't see any yet. We don't see any questions yet. So we're going to wait. If you have any questions, we can, uh, if you type them on the uh, left-hand side, we'll respond here. Uh, and if you want to hold back and just, you know, send them to us uh, you know, at some other time, we'd be more than happy to answer we have We have one comment from a um, an attendee in Canada saying July 1st is a holiday in Canada. So we'll have to make some sort of provisions for that. And everything's recorded anyway. Yeah. So if they do miss it. Yeah. So as this one here, if you can't make any of these for whatever reason, you know, a lot of people, this is the summer season, people are going to be on vacation. Uh, if you do sign up for the, the session, uh, it'll all be recorded 
and you'll be able to uh, every uh, Monday after the presentations that we're, we're given here, uh, they will be available on YouTube so you can watch them at any time, even while you're on vacation. Any other questions? I don't see any. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend and hope to see you soon.